So uh, next up, we'll hear from the county complexity folks about column function counter. Brendan, thank you. Um, welcome back after lunch. Um, hopefully, this won't tax you too much. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Arijit Shaw and Kuldeep Mill. Um, Arijit's the graduate student who did most of the real work on this. Um, okay, and so. When we were, after we did this work, um, you know, Kuldeep and I were talking about like how should we present this. Okay. Um, and Kuldeep had a vision for for how this was going to go, and you know it, it went a little something like this. They can hear it on Zoom. So, okay, to be fair, I wouldn't necessarily have presented it this way, but I wanted to remain as true as possible to Kudit's original vision. Okay, uh, I, I hope you all feel very motivated now. So, a little bit more dryly. Uh, here, here's what the problem actually is, okay? So, you know, Professor, what's this column function? All right, so. Okay, you've got a first order sentence, right? So this is a Boolean formula. Uh, my variables are all quantified. I have two types of um, quantifiers, you know, for all and exists. And I'd really rather just have one of them. Okay. Right, so in particular, like let's suppose I want to get rid of these existential quantifiers so that I'm just dealing with some sort of like, you know, I just want something that's a true statement um, you know, irrespective of then the binding of the remaining free variables. Okay. And so, columnization is where you're going to replace those existentially bound variables with functions of variables that were previously bound, right? Which are basically going to capture um, what would the what would be a successful binding of those variables given the things that were were previously bound, sort of outside in that scope. Okay. And those, right, so it eliminates the existentials, and those are called skolem functions. All right. So um, to be precise, and, and it actually matters here, right, so if I had this first order Boolean sentence, and let's suppose the body here could be another Boolean sentence on more variables, okay, uh, if I have a function that takes that, say, one existentially bound variable, and maps it, again, given a setting of the previously bound variables to something that preserves the truth value of the sentence, okay. then that's a skolem function. And again, I'm saying uh, you know, preserves the truth value because if the sentence was not true to begin with, right? if there was some binding of w for which there was no x, okay. um, this thing would have been false, and you might say, well, there's no skolem function. In this case, we're going to let that just be an arbitrary binding of the variable. Okay, so, so it's always going to exist. In some cases, it might be that you know, it doesn't matter uh, what the function value is for that binding of, of W. 
Okay, um, we're we're happy with anything. And so, very broad strokes, the problem that we're considering here is um, to count the number of scolem functions for a formula now that actually this is just going to be a propositional formula. So I just have a single alternation. Um, and to make things relatively simple, uh, all the domains are just going to be Boolean. OK, so n bits, m bits. Um, yeah, so it's a, OK, so from a very general problem to a, to a much simpler one. What, what, what's that? You think this is just a problem that like we just made up? Okay. Um, so what? It, yeah. What is it good for? Okay. So here's one possible application of this. So in system security, uh, a natural technique is randomization of your components. Okay. And traditionally, the way this is done is uh, by, say, taking the code and applying some sort of a transformation on it that preserves the semantics. Um, um, a very common thing is like address space randomization to try to make it hard to clobber important values in your, um, in your memory. Uh, a slightly different take on it that we have here is let's suppose that we have a specification for the function. OK. Um, now, if I look at this. Uh, sentence, right? So, you know, for all inputs, there is an output meeting the specification. The scolem count for that sentence is the number of possible functions that satisfy the specification. Right? And so, if I had a large count, that's telling me that somehow many possible implementations of this specification are possible. And so, then there's some scope for. Um, being able to get something out of uh, randomizing over which implementation you use. Uh, furthermore, using a reduction of approximate sampling to approximate counting, it would be possible to simulate the evaluation of a random function meeting that specification uh, at some points of your choice. Now, I'm not going to claim that this is really fast. I wouldn't actually want to use a system that was built on top of this. But it's at least telling you that you might be able to use this for some kind of prototyping. See how it works. Uh, a second application would be modeling uncertainty of player strategies. Okay, so again, like let's suppose that I have a formula indicating if X is a good response to some uh, game state or, or initial move W. Okay, then. Um, a random scolem function is a maximum entropy good response strategy. Right? And so I can try to use that as, as a model of you know, what are the possible um, strategies that an opponent could be using in this game. And then the scolem count, in turn, is giving you the, the entropy of those strategies. So, you know, OK, these applications are a little bit made up. Uh, and the third application is I would like to hear from you. Uh, if you can think of any more applications for this problem, because it is a new problem. All right. So having seen this and having been in these workshops all week, um, you might immediately wonder, is this just first order model accounting? Right? Like, you know, I could write this um, sentence, right? So this part is just propositional, and there's one relation here, F, okay? And if I look at this um, uh, formula where, with this like you know existential counting quantifier, uh, yeah. So models for this for this relation f correspond to a scolem function. Okay. And this is a first order sentence with two variables. It's you know it's in that 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 fragment that we can solve. What's the problem? And the problem is, you know, tractable for first order model counting means polynomial on the domain size. But in these cases, uh, you know, we have like m bits, and so we end up with some sort of a relatively large domain. Okay. So it's not exactly tractable. Okay. So we need, we do need other techniques. Um, okay. But the problem's still a little bit hard. Uh, so we change things a little bit more, right? Um, it's, Immediate that that exact counting is is sharply hard. Right? You know, 
is propositional model counting is a special case. Um, and so there's two answers to this. One is we're going to consider, of course, randomized uh, approximate counting. But moreover, um, we're also going to need to use oracles for uh, you know, these, these subroutines of like model counting and approximate sampling. We're not going to use too many model counting queries. Um, ultimately, it will be two. Um, but you know, sort of the, the number of these queries that we use is in some sense going to be the main complexity measure for this thing. Now, the other problem here is the number of possible functions uh, is potentially very large. And I can't even write down a number that this, that's this large in some you know, reasonable amount of time. Okay. And yeah, so the answer here is, well, OK, we're going to just work with the log of the number of scrolling functions. Um, and in cases where maybe I was interested in the entropy of that distribution, this is basically what I want anyway. Okay. Um, it's still, again, not a problem that is immediately obvious how to tackle in a scalable way. Right. So the main results that we have are that we um, get an approx multiplicative approximate count of the log of the number of scolum functions, given uh, so some polynomial number of calls to approximate sampling and counting oracles and two calls to an exact sharp sat oracle. Okay. And in exper with these experiments, we'll see that it scales much better than a totally naive baseline. Right. Um, personally, I hope that this is not the last word on the problem and we'll come back to some, you know, hopefully potential ways it can be improved later. But our method is based on the following three key observations. Okay. The first is that um, the count factorizes with respect to the input. Right. You know, I can set the you know the value of f uh, for the different w's independently. And so, in particular, uh, when I look at the log count, right, this is just a big sum of the log counts. Right for for each possible um, binding of those universal variables w's. Right. Um, okay. Now, second, we can partition the domain into the following three pieces. Right. Ones where there was no um, response for the for the x variables. Ones where there's a unique x that satisfies the formula, and ones where there's at least two. And those first two pieces um, have, you know, really specific counts for the number of x's, right? Here, any, any, any x binding will work. Here, there's a unique one. And when I look at the log, okay, so yeah, that's, that's just m and that's zero. And for this last piece, um, what's nice is that after I look at the log, the number of possible, um, uh, responses lies somewhere in this range 1 to m. And that's going to ensure that I can approximate it easily. So with this, with this framework now, the algorithm is actually pretty straightforward. Okay. So first of all, we're just going to directly count um, those inputs that don't have a response. And that's just going to be with our with the SATO goal. That's one of our calls. Now, the body of it is actually going to be uh, estimating this contribution from those Ws that had more than two, or at least two responses. Okay. So first, I'm going to count the number of Ws that had at least two responses. That's my second call. Um, and I'm going to invoke it on. Right, just counting with respect to W, so this is a projected model count, for this formula that captures that, yeah, there were, there were two distinct uh, X responses. Okay, so obviously, this is satisfiable uh, if and only if um, you're, you're, you're in this set for Ws. Okay. Right, and so then what I do now is, now we're going to be sampling um, universal variables 
approximately uniformly at random by invoking our approximate sampling oracle on this formula. Okay. And then we're going to use the approximate counting oracle, right, um, for that W then to approximate the count once I've, I've fixed W in here of the number of possible X responses. And I'm just going to take a running count of that, rescaled appropriately from the number of samples that I take ultimately uh, up to the actual number of these um, things that have at least two solutions. Okay. And so then, yeah, my final estimate is just, right, the pieces that had a unique solution contribute zero to the log count. So this contributes them. And then this is my thing that I got by sampling. And in order to get a uh, one plus epsilon multiplicative approximation, because this log count was in this range one to m, I only need this polynomial number of samples. Okay. So it's not that complicated, I hope. Let me, are there any questions about like why this works? No. In yeah. fact, you only need a linear, you only need a linear number of, uh, that's right. Okay. So anyway, like that's about all I have to say about this theoretically right now. So um, onward, implementation experiments. So there's an important optimization. Uh, rather than just taking a fixed size sample um, that you would get from, say, like the Chernoff bound, there was an algorithm from Dagam et al. that adaptively chooses a number of samples, um, and it's giving us the same guarantee as if we had used a Chernoff bound with a fixed size sample, but you're using fewer uh, runs of that approximate model counting oracle, uh, sampling and model counting, and of course, that's really important in practice. Okay, but that's not our work, so anyway, just we use it. Um, and then we use, again, some recent state-of-the-art systems for uh, the various components. Okay. And now the naive baseline that we're going to compare against. Um, like, really, okay, this is the first work to study this problem. So we didn't really have a good baseline. So it kind of does the, um, you know, the naive thing, right? Like, everything is just exact counting, right? You know, I'm just enumerating those those w's that uh, have two distinct solutions and i do the exact count for them okay and obviously um you know this blows up so you know i guess it's a straw man but then again like what else is there okay and so yeah there's some state-of-the-art tools for the uh enumeration count okay so we have two types of benchmarks that we look at. Right. Um, one is to examine efficiency and scaling, and these are basically benchmarks from um, works on skull and synthesis. Okay, so it's these QDF benchmarks. Um, now, it's going to turn out that the baseline that we have for getting those exact counts uh, really sucks. So. You know, we also want to do um, experiments to check the accuracy in practice. So we need some really easy benchmarks. Um, and so we use these 158 instances that in particular have very small input sizes. And so where the exact count can succeed. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, the story for scaling is, is fairly simple. Um, out of the 608 instances, the naive baseline solves eight. You know, there's the plot of the running time. Uh, and this new method solved 379 out of the 608. So obviously, it's not everything. But um, you know, there's a big improvement from like actually just literally enumerating all of the uh, possible Ws and doing this column count. Um, and you know, so if, if I look at, OK, well, how long would it take, right? look at the number of counter calls that would have been invoked um, to solve these instances, right? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very large number of exact count calls. Okay. So it's somewhat implausible that um, you would be able to, to, to do this without doing some kind of like a, a sampling style 
um, production in the growing zone. Okay. So, um, right, for accuracy, just to stress the point, uh, the exact thing could only solve eight of those 608 instances, and that's not enough to get a good um, measure of the accuracy. Uh, so we use the other 158. Um, and we're going to run this thing uh, with our um, epsilon parameter being 0.8. So the guarantee just says that the count should lie between, you know, one fifth and 1.8 times um, the true log count. Okay. So that's what this, you know, upper and lower bound is. You know, what's 1.8 and what's 1 fifth? Um, and so the actual counts look like this. Um, and Okay, so some statistics on the, the relative error here. Uh, so the mean relative error was about a fifth. Um, so that's, that's you know, significantly better than um, you know, a relative error of 0.8. And out of the 158 benchmarks, the largest relative error was less than a half. Okay. So it does seem like it's substantially outperforming the, the guarantee that we have. Okay. Um, questions about this? Yeah. You seem not happy that I was going to ask you, but no, I'm very happy. I, like I thought that everybody was just going to be like you know hibernating after lunch. So given that we all love circuits, if if the if the thing under your quantifiers is something that is a DDNF, do you have an F press for this column count? But if every Oracle call is linear time. Yeah, so I guess the, I mean, the real question, well, you know, let me just, let me come back to this in like 30 seconds. Okay. As this is like my first open question. Oh, it's related to it. Okay. Maybe my first and my second. Okay. Uh, okay, so we introduced this new problem of approximate counting of skull and functions. And we proposed a randomized algorithm for a guaranteed multiplicative approximation to the log number of functions. We use the oracle for exact counting twice and this linear number of calls to the approximate uh, sampling and counting oracle. Uh, we managed to get 379 out of 608 of these benchmarks. And uh, we did outperform the uh, theoretical relative error guarantee on these 158 easy instances. I don't know how, how good we're doing on the 608 instances because uh, we can't solve them exactly. Um, but it seems plausible that, that this, this method or maybe some future method along this line could be useful in practice for these problems. Um, and again, just to stress, like, you know, counting models seemed hard, but people worked on it. Synthesizing skull and functions seemed hard. Yeah, you know, people worked at it. Counting skull and functions, like, you know, seems outrageous because, you know, I can't even write down most skull and functions. They're just too big, right? Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, like, we are actually able to get some what seem to be plausibly useful approximations to that count, okay? Um, and so I think really, like, nobody thought about, nobody, like, dared to consider what if I could solve this problem before, you know, and that's the reason for the da 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 you know? Okay, so questions. So first of all, um, is that exact model counting necessary? Right. Uh, you know, I used it twice. Um, I don't think I really need it uh, for the second time. But for the first one, like what I actually wanted a good guarantee for is um, the number of uh, you know universally bi universal bindings for which there's no existential binding. Okay. Um, and we, you know, like the, the naive way to do this, you would like to just like negate that formula. Okay. Um, and, you know, but like if you started out saying, well, you know, I have like whatever DNF and so I have my FP RAS for DNF, let's say, and then I'm negating that, then um, I don't know that I'm getting my same nice, like, you know, relative, like, multiplicative error guarantee. Um, you know, maybe if, so you have another, another representation, your, your DDNNF or whatever, and if you can get the FPRAS for the, for the count, and you can, like, say, push through that negation, right, then, uh, 
um, hopefully you can just get rid of the, the, the need for the exact model counting and indeed get an FPRAS. That's, so I hope that's, that's true. Um, my question is, is really like, do I need it at all? Or, or how broadly do I need, do I actually need the exact model counting oracle? Because that seems to be the main, at least to me, seems to be the main barrier to um, getting the FPRAS. Right. Uh, the other thing which you might be uh, enticed by is, you know, we have many calls to this approximate sample and count oracle on the same formula, right? This just sort of screams for some kind of either compilation or, or reuse across the different iterations. You know, how, how can you exploit this? Um, Kuldeep had some motivation uh, for extending to more general problems of counting uninterpreted functions in S&T. Uh, I do not feel qualified to talk about this further. <laughs> and, and finally, yeah, I mean, I am, I am interested in other applications. Like, okay, so we're daring to ask the question, you know, what if we could count skull and functions? Like, like what can you do? It's like, please put on your science fiction hat. And yeah, um, your questions for me come here. Questions? Ample time for questions. Does the count tell you something about how hard the synthesis is? It's not clear that I because don't, you yeah. you don't want to you want to find a small representation of a function, right? So you don't. Well, yeah. So so right. So it's not going to tell you much about the synthesis problem, right? Because the vast, assuming that it's like not unique, and and if it's unique, it's actually an easy problem. But assuming that it's it's not unique or extremely not unique, then yeah, most of these instances are just not things that you can write down. So, you know, most of them are completely irrelevant from the standpoint of efficient synthesis. Some questions. So if the, the, the thing under the quantifiers is something that has this, so, so this is an arbitrary propositional formula, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's something with symmetries, like in the first order model accounting, then I guess things also become easier or? Uh, should, right? Because yeah, I mean, maybe you can factorize things further um, and then just solve the individual uh, uh, pieces. Yeah. And then scale. So thinking about your uh, second question, uh, so what kind of information do you think would be useful to say between uh, different calls to sample counter? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so for example, um, okay, just just by analogy to 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 uh, like set solving, right? You know, I know that if I um, you know I have these like derived clauses that I could potentially like share across runs. Um, and I guess, you know, it, it's, it's legitimate to ask, is there some analogous thing that I could or should be sharing, um, you know, for these, uh, say like approximate counting, um, you know, like I took these samples, I did this count, but you know, maybe I can back up to something with some free variables in it. Um, and then, you know, resample those variables or something. I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's that's why I started with questions. Though. Any final question? If not, the balance of my time goes to Jim. Yeah, you can get to talk for an extra five minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you, Brendan. Yeah.